This is a 1990 Lexus LS 400 and it's the beginning of Lexus. I mean it. In order to find the beginning of Mercedes Benz, you'd have to go back to like the late 1800s, but this was the first Lexus, the first model from the first year. This was the car that started it all. And today, I'm going to take you on a tour of it. Now, to be clear, this isn't the first Lexus ever made, but it is an original LS 400 from the original model year, 1990, and it's a pristine one-owner example with just 38,000 miles. It was sold new here in the Seattle area on November 1, 1990. I've borrowed this car from Lexus of Seattle, which is a rather large Lexus dealership here in the Seattle area, and it belongs to a salesperson. This is how you know you got a good Lexus dealership. When and the employees are driving around in these. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the LS 400, but first we've got to cover the past. That's because this car is tremendously important to the modern automotive industry. You see, before this car, the only luxury vehicles were either American or European. And by the 1980s, the American luxury cars had gotten kind of crappy and they were really only being purchased by old people. That meant if you wanted a good luxury car in the 80s, your only options were European brands, Mercedes-Benz and Jaguar on the high end or BMW on the lower end. They were making good cars, but they weren't the most reliable vehicles, and most importantly, they were very expensive. And so in came Toyota, and Toyota said, we can do this, and we can do it better, and we can do it cheaper. There are some amazing stories from the founding of Lexus. Toyota obsessively analyzed Americans, what they bought, where they shopped, what luxury meant to them. They tore apart competitive luxury sedans and drove millions of development miles and spent tens of millions of development dollars. And the result was this. Well, sort of. This is the new 2018 Lexus LS. I reviewed it a few weeks ago, and it's the fifth generation of the Lexus LS. The car you just saw, the 1990 LS 400, kicked off the Lexus brand, which was a massive success. And here we are almost 30 years later, and the LS line is still going strong. But anyway, back to the old one. The old one came out for the 1990 model year. It was originally sold alongside the smaller ES sedan, and the two were later joined by the sporty SC Coupe. Of course, the Lexus lineup has now blossomed into many, many more models, and it's all on the back of the success of this car. It used a 250 horsepower 4 liter V8, made it to a 4 speed automatic transmission and rear wheel drive. The starting price of this car back in 1990 was just $36,000, although this one had some options to drive that price up to $45,270, which is the equivalent of about $85,000 today. But it was a bargain back then, especially compared with the more expensive and less reliable European alternative. So today I'm going to show you around the LS 400 and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of the original Lexus. Then I'm going to drive it carefully and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the LS 400, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer where I've compiled a list of the weirdest and strangest old Japanese luxury cars currently listed for sale on Autotrader. I'm going to start with a simple size comparison between this, the new 2018 LS, and this, the old 1990. This is basically 30 years of Lexus evolution, and you can see the size difference is substantial. This thing is just gargantuan compared to this one. This car is actually almost a foot longer than the original LS, and it isn't just that. This thing is just bigger in every way. It has a bigger presence, a, a bigger look, and bigger wheels. This car now has 20 inch alloy wheels. This had huge wheels for 1990, 15 inches. Next, I want to talk about exterior styling differences between these two cars. It's probably the area where there is the greatest difference between new Lexus and old Lexus. You can see the new one has all these angular cuts and aggressive lines, and it has sort of this dramatic design basically everywhere you look. The old one was just 
so simple, so understated, so basic. They didn't want you to think that it was ugly in any way, so they kept it incredibly conservative. And it's the exact same situation inside. Cars now take so many risks with their interior design. Everybody wants to seem cool and new and fresh. But the old LS was just so simple and so basic on the inside. Everything was made to work and be functional. Compare that to the new LS and you can see just how far things have advanced. The interior is just dramatically more, well, dramatic. It's more beautiful, more special, no doubt, but admittedly it has lost a little bit of that sort of simple functionality that the old one did so well. Anyway, comparison over. I thought some of you might find that interesting. Next up, on to the quirks and features of the original LS. I'm going to start on the interior and the gauge cluster. The gauge cluster is kind of unusual. You see how when I turn on the car, the little warning lights look like they're sort of behind the tachometer. Like there's different levels of gauge cluster. Like it's kind of a 3D thing. Well, that's actually a little bit deceiving. It turns out that those little warning lights are being projected from the roof of the gauge cluster onto the cluster itself and it gives it sort of that appearance. It must have seemed very futuristic to do this back in 1990. I bet they thought they were pretty cool. Interestingly, in spite of their very futuristic gauge cluster, they still used an analog odometer in this car. This car doesn't have a digital odometer. I almost wonder if it was some sort of federal mandate back in 1990 that you had to use an analog odometer because it just doesn't seem right when you look at the gauge cluster and then you look at that old school looking odometer. It especially doesn't seem right considering they used a digital trip odometer. So you could get a digital trip odometer that showed you how far you've gone on your last trip, but the overall odometer was a traditional analog one that just rolled and showed you the numbers. Next up, I mentioned simplicity, and indeed this car is all about simplicity. It's almost unbelievable how many fewer choices you have in this one compared with the new one. Consider, for example, the climate control in this car, you have three different choices of fan speed, low, medium, and high. It's not one of those dials you can turn to make the fan go as fast as you want, uh-uh. Three choices, and that's all you get. And it's the same with the heated seats. In the new LS, you can choose how much you want the seat to heat you. You can choose where on the seat you want it. In this thing, you get one setting, on or off. That's it. Interestingly, the original LS is a little bit more configurable than I expected. Go down to the center console in the transmission selector and you will see that there are a few different switches. The driver can choose a few different options. One of them is suspension. This car has normal or sport suspension. This car has a sport mode. Who knew the original Lexus LS 400 had a sport mode? Also in the same vein of the who knew it was on the original Lexus LS 400, how about the middle switch? which allows you to adjust the suspension height. I had no idea this car had raising and lowering suspension, but it does. You can put it in high mode. The owner's manual says you do it if you're on a bumpy or unpaved road, and then apparently it gives you more ground clearance. The original Lexus LS 400 had two different suspension settings, and actually it had three. According to the owner's manual, if you're going at high speed, the car lowers itself and then goes into low mode. The third suspension setting, I had no idea. The final thing you can choose from in the middle, the final switch here is the power switch. You can choose between normal power or power. And I guess that's if you want some sort of extra power for maybe a highway on ramp or something. Another interesting item in that center console in there on the transmission lever itself, there is a button for overdrive. <laughs> I remember 90s Japanese cars had this. Nobody knew what it meant who bought these cars, but if you had overdrive selected, it would sort of on the highway, keep your RPMs a little lower to improve your fuel economy. Next up, more interesting interior items. To the left of the steering wheel, there is a switch that apparently can turn on and off the remote. And control whether the remote can lock or unlock the doors. I've never seen this switch in any other car, but it's in the LS 400. Another interesting item on the stereo head unit, I like the fact that you can adjust the bass, the mid-range, the treble, balance, fader, but you can't just adjust them with dials. They're little dials you have to press and then they pop out for you to adjust them. And then when you're done adjusting, you basically push the dial back in so you can store it until it's time for you to adjust those things again. Another interesting item, in the new 2018 LS, you can put it in valet mode with a little pin in the infotainment system, and then the valet doesn't have access to the trunk. The 1990 LS also has a valet mode, but it's a little bit more rudimentary. Basically, over on the left of the steering wheel, you can stick the key inside a little keyhole, twist it, and then you've locked the trunk and the fuel door 
using the keyhole because basically you've locked the keyhole and that locks out those latches from being able to be open. Then you give the valet the valet key and the valet won't have access to the trunk or to your fuel door. It's sort of the most old school valet mode possible. It doesn't actually lock the trunk any more than it normally would. It just locks the latch to the trunk so you can't get in there. But hey, it worked. Next up, we move on to the dimmer switch, which is to the left of the steering wheel. It's not all that unusual to see a dimmer switch in a car. Even most modern cars have a dimmer, so you can dim the interior lights if you want. The weird thing about this one is the dimmer switch can actually turn off the entire gauge cluster. So if you're getting tired of like seeing how fast you're going, you just kind of adjust that dimmer switch on down and then it blacks out the gauge cluster so you can no longer see your speedometer. I've never seen a modern dimmer switch where you can completely kill the entire gauge cluster. Next up, also in that vicinity, it's worth mentioning this car has a power tilt and telescoping steering wheel that was the kind of thing only mercedes-benz and rolls-royce had back in 1990 but the lexus ls 400 had it also interesting how about this you know how when you leave your lights on in a car there's some urgent tone that comes on to remind you that you've left your lights on so you turn them off well this car if you left the sunroof open there was that urgent tone that came on to let you know that you turn the car off and then this extra tone came on and let you know this sunroof was open. That is pretty forward thinking for 1990. Another thing I absolutely love about this car is that it has an automatic seat belt height adjuster. In virtually every other car, including most luxury cars today, you manually just adjust the seat belt height since that's something you'll be doing like, I don't know, once every nine years or something. But in this car, it was power operated. You pushed a little switch on the door and then the seat belt would rise up or down depending on how you were pressing the switch. The thing I find most interesting is there's a little arrow on the seatbelt itself and it tells you where normal is. To me, it's kind of making a little bit of a judgment about your height, isn't it? If you have it lower than normal, well, then you're short. And your Lexus reminds you that every time you look at the seat belt. Next up, we move on to the rear seat. Now, if you get in the new LS and you get in the back seat, you have the ability to basically do everything. You got heated seats, cooled seats. You can change the climate control, the stereo back here, everything. In the back of the original LS, you got three things you can do pretty much. There's an ashtray so you can put out your cigarettes. There's a cigarette lighter so you can light your cigarettes. And then there's one little dial that allows you to change how much air is coming through the vent on the center console pointing towards the back. That's all you got. Also interesting in the new LS, if you drop the center armrest, it contains a touch screen, which has a million different functions. You can adjust the climate control and the radio and all that stuff using that screen. In the old LS, if you drop the center armrest, it's an armrest. That's it. That's all you get, it's an armrest in the traditional sense of the term. Now, I will say I am slightly selling the back seat of the original LS short because it does have one feature that surprised me. It has individual reading lights above each rear seat. You push a little button and the reading light turns on, so at least you can read while you're being driven along. Next up, moving on to the exterior of the LS400, where there are quite a few interesting quirks. I'm gonna start with the antenna. Now, right now it's in its down or resting position, but when you turn on the radio, Yes, that's right. It automatically rises to get better reception. The only issue was you had to remember to turn off your radio before you went into a car wash or else it would snag the antenna and it could damage it. And since it was power operated, it wasn't exactly cheap to replace. Another interesting old school design detail from this car was the horn. <laughs> This was supposed to be this big V8 rear-wheel drive, full-size luxury sedan meant to take on the top European rivals, and the horn sounded like a Geo Metro asking permission to enter your lane. Excuse me! Another interesting item on the outside of this car is that the fog lights are yellow. And I don't just mean they're like a little yellow tinted, I mean they're like deep yellow, like French cars in the 1970s. There's almost actually like a yellowish green tint to it. It's hard to see, but you can kind of see what I'm talking about. All Lexus fog lights from this era were yellow. I have no idea why. They must have come up with some reason. Next up, we got to talk about the chrome trim on the wheel arches on this car over the wheels. This is probably the only thing on this car that isn't factory, but it is a 
period correct modification. This was very common in the late 80s and early 90s as like a way to protect your fender and also is supposed to look cool, but it has not aged well and it definitely dates this car. This probably would have been a dealer installed option back in 1990. The dealer probably talked the original owner into these little chrome guards over the wheels. And you can see this on a lot of 1990s luxury cars. It was common on Mercedes, Benz, even Infiniti from that era and it has never looked good. And next up, moving around to the back. Something interesting I wanna point out, it doesn't say LS400 on the back of this car. In fact, it doesn't say LS400 anywhere on this car. Back in 1990, Lexus was trying to sell a brand and not a specific model, and they wanted you to know more than anything, not that you were following an LS400 or an ES250, but that you were following a Lexus. And so Lexus is displayed prominently on the back, but the model name is it. Eventually they did add the model name, but it wasn't on originally. Next, we move under the hood, and it's very different from the new LS under here. In the new LS, it's completely shrouded in plastic. Everything is completely covered. It's very sleek under the hood, but this car did it a little bit differently. Everything is exposed and open, and you can basically see the entire engine. Now, Lexus was very proud of this V8. Back then, it was Toyota's first V8 in North America. They didn't even have a V8 in a pickup truck at the time. As a result, this V8 meant a lot to Toyota, meant a lot to Lexus, and you can clearly see the Lexus badge prominently displayed front and center the moment you open the hood. Finally, we must go into the glove box and have a look at the owner's manual. Now, I've looked through the owner's manual already. It's actually not all that unusual or quirky, which kind of surprised me since this car is so old, but there are some interesting items, including one I find almost unbelievable. On page 51, under seat belts, it says, replace the seat belt if the warning label under the sleeve can be seen. The warning label, replace belt, will appear if the belt receives a severe impact or other force. The way I read that is, if the car's in an accident and the belt is jammed violently and has a severe impact, a warning label will somehow appear and let you know to replace the belt. In other words, the warning label is not visible right now, but after a severe impact, it will become visible. How? and tell you it's time to replace the seatbelt. I've never heard of that before, but maybe I'm just an idiot and that's how it always is on all cars. But either way, that's how it is on this one. Also interesting, inside the owner's manual pouch, I have right here the inspection certificate for this car. This was the original inspection certificate when it was originally delivered. It still has the factory stamp that it passed the factory quality checks and it even has the port of entry inspection center check marks in the port technician's name who signed off on this. And the last interesting item inside this booklet, that would be the accessory collection. They're trying to sell you the usual, you know, paint protection, a first aid kit, wheel protection, but they're also trying to sell you a car phone. Take a look at this. You can get a car phone for your Lexus LS400, or as they call it, the LS400 Lexus Cellular Telephone. If you go through and read it, it has a lot of crap about how great a cellular phone is, but it also says the telephone handset fits discreetly into the LS400 center console, maintaining the interior elegance of your LS400. Some of the features they tout, including the storage of up to 101 telephone numbers, 12 of which can be dialed automatically from the command module, it also comes with a warranty and pre-origination dialing, so numbers may be dialed before charges begin. <laughs> that was the car phone you could get for your original LS400, and I bet not one of those has worked since about 1996. And so that's a comprehensive tour of the car that started Lexus. And now it's time to get it out on the road. All right, driving the LS400. First thing I noticed is the mirrors are just pathetically small. Visibility was a very different game back then. Then again, as I say that and I look around, you know, you can see the windows go much lower than in modern cars. Modern cars have such high belt line for style and also for, you know, to get equipment into the door panels, whatever. In this thing you can see for days when you turn around. The driving position is very unusual. You don't, in modern luxury cars, you're sort of up more and you have more of a commanding view out and you're sort of more of like a king of the road kind of thing. This feels more like, like a Camry, to be honest. Going over bumps, the ride is reasonably smooth, but it's not excessively smooth. Like it's not anything that like a modern car 
uh, would be. It's certainly nothing like the, the new LS. It's almost hard to remember a time when this was like the gold standard for luxury cars. I mean, this ride quality is just sort of like how a normal automobile drives now. I will say it is quite quiet in here. Impressively quiet considering you know, this is sort of an older car. I definitely was not expecting that. The steering is light. It's almost excessively light. I mean, it's linear, but like you turn the wheel like halfway and like the car just moves a little and this thing was not to be hustled. But this was at a time when luxury sedans were not sports cars like they are today. It's almost hard to remember. But, um, you know, there was, no, there was no Tesla, there was no, Jaguars weren't fast cars. Uh, people just had sort of luxury sedans. There was no AMG S-Class that Mercedes was building. There was no M760. You just had a kind of a nice luxury automobile and that was what they were going for and that's what they did. Boy, is it smooth. And in fact, this whole car is smooth. You know, I mean, there's, there's nothing rattling, obviously. There's nothing shaking, but beyond that, like, there's no harshness. You push the accelerator and it just does its thing without much fuss, without complaining or, or excessive noise. The ride quality is harsher than I was expecting it to be. I mean, these cars from this era just they weren't you know they weren't incredibly comfortable in terms of ride quality i'm really surprised at the driving position i really feel like i'm in a camry in a modern car you're just you sit higher even a car not an suv you sit higher they give you a more commanding feel you look out over a long hood whatever whatever it is screens maybe you're not here i don't know whatever it is the driving position just doesn't feel that um I, when i was driving the new ls which i did just a minute ago you just feel you feel like the king of the road and in this thing you feel like you're on the road you're one of the road i'm gonna get a little space i'm gonna punch it here we'll see what 250 horsepower on a four speed can do oh there's an accurate vigor these cars should get together all right here goes well it can't do much <laughs> you know these old four speeds it's just impossible because they just have such long gears that like you're just building and building and building and that uh, that is not an aggressively fast automobile. The truth of the matter is, in the end, this car, by today's standards, is far short of a flagship luxury sedan. It doesn't have any of the tech you'd expect in today's ones, obviously, but also it's just not as big. The mirrors aren't big. You can't see The power is not there. The performance isn't there. It's nice and quiet, but it isn't as comfortable as a modern car. The ride's not as comfortable. The seat's not as comfortable. But it's cool to see where it started. It's really cool to see where it started. This thing would never pass today for anything more than like a base level mid-sized car, but this, there's more to it than that. This is, I'm not just driving some used 90s car. This car was a big deal for Lexus and for the car industry, and it's cool to see where it started. And so that's the original LS400. You know, young people might just take for granted that Lexus is just another brand, but really it wasn't always that way. And launching a new brand is not exactly an easy thing. 25 years after they came out, Infiniti and Acura are still having trouble figuring out where they fit in. Tesla is mired in production issues and Genesis has had a hard time gaining any traction at all. But Lexus was a smash hit, a huge success, and it all started right here here with the 1990 LS 400. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the LS 400's look is dull and aging and it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration is poor and it gets a 1 out of 10. Handling is fine, decently secure, but steering is light and vague and there's a lot of body roll and it gets a 3 out of 10. Fun factor is almost non-existent except for the fun that comes from driving a pristine relic from another era and it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, cool factor is low, though not boring economy car low, and it gets a 4 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 14 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. It's good for its time period, but obviously mediocre by today's standards, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is fine, good but not amazing, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is good, the car is well built, but the materials look cheap by modern standards, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a sedan, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Value is decent, these are really cheap, which is nice because they're both iconic and reliable, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 29 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 43 out of 100, and you can see how it compares to rivals from this era. The Mercedes 560 SEL is more fun and nicer inside. The Rolls-Royce Silver Spur is more luxurious, but reliability is a question. Meanwhile, the original 2002 Hyundai Equus ties it in nearly every measure, which makes sense considering the first Equus was basically designed to be a carbon copy of this LS. 